morning. morning. It's nice to see you again. It's nice to be gathered in person and online as well. Just a a couple of announcements this week. So uh, hopefully it stays dry and we can actually get on some of the walks. Uh, This week on Thursday, the 5th of August at 11am, we will have the prayer walk and litter pick. Um, That just means we'll walk around the area, we'll pick up litter. Wind church was very clean, I have to say. I was impressed. Well done. <laughs> um, so we might move on to somewhere else around the area. And we just pray for the community as we walk through. So do come along to that if you're free, Thursday the 5th at 11 a.m. We'll just meet here. Um, and then just a heads up for the following week, on Tuesday the 10th of August, we'll have another circuit walk. Last week was cancelled due to the rain. Um, so this one's Tuesday the 10th of August. we will meet at 7 p.m. Just, it's... The car park just down from the Crown Plaza Hotel. There's a bit more park in there, so we'll meet there and we'll just go for a nice wee dander, but it will be weather dependent. So those are the announcements. And then it's just lovely to welcome David with us this morning. It's been a wee while, and so it's nice to have you and Helen as well here to support. So I look forward to hear what you have to say to us. Welcome to you this morning and to all who are joining us from wherever you are. It's lovely for us to be back in Knockbreda again, remembering the years we shared with you from 1987 to 1992. We have many memories, not all, not only of all that happened here, but of all the the people that we knew, some who have gone on to that greater life beyond, but uh, we remember you all with great affection and it's good to share with you today in in worship. Uh, The theme of our worship uh, this morning is celebrating life's journey with Jesus. Christians can be described as the pilgrim people of God. And in the Bible, this idea of the spiritual life as a journey is a very important theme. It was all about continual change and movement. We're always moving in company with God, one more step along the road. So we're thinking of that theme of journeying of being a pilgrim people, of not just staying in the one place, but of moving on in our thinking and in the way we live. And our invitation to worship, come to the God of welcome, who invites you to a place of safety and healing. Come to the God of salvation, who challenges us, to work for justice and freedom. Come to the God of holiness who makes the earth a sacred space. Come and be made one people in the reconciling love of God. We remain seated as we sing and we're going to sing now the words of the hymn, Come, let us sing of a wonderful love.
before we pray, we keep some moments of silence when we reflect on our own lives, when we remember the love and welcome of God that is given to us always, and also our dreams for the future, for what we want to see, who we want to be, and what in God's name we can do to build the kingdom in this world. So let's be quiet for a moment and then we'll pray. As we think of the theme of celebrating life's journey with Jesus, we think of that journey that we're on and where it will take us and how it will change our lives. Explorer God, you have put within us a spirit of adventure to move beyond the immediate and to see in the ordinary things your extraordinary presence of love. Propelled by your spirit, may each day become an adventure of people, tasks, places, and responsibilities. And when we feel gray and lifeless, may you remind us that each day holds its own gifts, new truths, restored vision, inner healing, and the possibility to forgive even our enemies. Loving God, you have revealed your nature and your purpose in Jesus as we reflect on our journey with him and where he will take us and how he will guide us, give us that humble spirit that is willing to trust him even when we do not understand, even when we do not see where the journey is leading us. Hand in hand, may we walk with him and face whatever comes. We come together as the people of God today and we know that while he has given us many gifts, we know that we have often failed or turned aside or lost the vision. And so today we ask for God's forgiveness in these moments. Lord, forgive us when we have hidden behind locked doors scared to speak out for what we believe, protecting ourselves from hostility and conflict, liberating God, set us free and forgive us. When we have shut others out of our lives, excluding those who are different or strange, prefer preferring the comfort of being with people like us, liberating God, forgive us and set us free. When we have closed our minds to new possibilities or to different ways of doing things, refusing to take the risks of exploration, saying no to the adventure of mission, liberating God, forgive us, and set us free. When we have hoarded what we have, keeping our resources under lock and key, refusing to share the abundance of God's generosity, liberating God, <coughs> forgive us and set us free. And in this time of worship, May each of us know and feel the presence of Christ nearer to us than breathing and closer than hands and feet. 
And sometimes if his presence seems to be even in the shadows, we will find him in the shadows and we'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. We offer our morning prayer in his name and for his sake and for the glory of God. Amen. morning again. <laughs> we have spent some time previously thinking about who we would want on our A-team, the best of the best. Today we're going to think about the people that no one wants on their team. We're going to watch a clip from the first Hobbit movie, which is based on the book by Tolkien. The dwarves have been making their way to the Lonely Mountain to reclaim their home from the gold thirsty dragon. As part of their team, Gandalf the wizard brought along a hobbit named Bilbo. Thorin, dwarf heir to the throne, has made it no secret that he does not want Bilbo on his team. Bilbo has no experience of the dangers outside of his quiet little village. He doesn't know how to fight. He doesn't have the same strength as the dwarves. He doesn't seem to belong to this adventure. But along the way, things start to change. All right. Bilbo is here. It's quite safe. You. What were you doing? You nearly got yourself killed. You would not survive in the wild. And you had no place amongst us. I have never been so wrong in all my life. <laughs> in that clip we see Thorne come to the realisation that he was wrong about Bilbo. Time after time Bilbo saves the lives of the dwarves. He is compassionate, brave, clever. He begins to realise his potential and quite frankly the dwarves would never have got as far as they did without the help of Bilbo. All of this comes down to the fact that Gandalf gave Bilbo the opportunity to be part of the team. In today's Bible story, we will hear about when Jesus called his first disciples, Simon, Andrew, James, and John, smelly, poor fishermen, with a tendency to lose their temper. Jesus then goes on to invite a tax collector, a thief, a protester, and others to be part of his team. The kind of people you wouldn't want on your team Yet here was Jesus, the saviour of the world, asking people to join and be his disciples. Look at how this opportunity changed the lives of those men and women. If Jesus had rejected those people like most of society, then they may never have realised their potential, their worth. Who have you rejected from your team? Why? Are you preventing them from realising their potential and their worth? Well, follow the example of Jesus and give them the opportunity. And the reality is that people have also asked this question about you.
do they want you on their team? When we feel tempted to judge people based on who they are or what they have done, it is important to remember that we are all sinners. And some people won't want us on their team because of the things that we have done. Yet, just like those first disciples and the ones that followed, Jesus calls each of us. Jesus wants all of us on his team. He wants you on his team. In spite of all the things that people might use against us to reject us from their team. What a truth to celebrate. So let's be like Bilbo. And let's be like those first disciples. Let's say yes to being part of a team. And let's be like Jesus by giving everyone the opportunity to be a part of a team. The team of Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that the invitation to be a part of your team is for everyone. Even those we maybe wouldn't have chosen to be a part of our team. We are sorry for the times when our prejudices have excluded others and made them feel unworthy or unwanted. Thank you that, because of the death and resurrection of Jesus, our sin doesn't stop us from being invited onto your team. Help us to answer yes to your invitation, and be ready for the opportunities and changes that will bring. And let's celebrate that journey with Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Heather, thank you, and thank you for reminding us that the invitation is to everyone, whoever that person is, wherever they're found, wherever they are in their own journey, they're welcome because Jesus calls them too. One of the most important times in our worship, well, each moment is important, but one of the most important is the time when we listen for the word of God, that we will hear through the readings what God is sharing with us. Today, John and uh, Mabel are going to share the readings with us. I remember when we were in Nockbreda, John, uh, Mabel and you came to join us here. That was a, a very important time, I hope for you, but I know it has been for... <clears throat> Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he mediates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. May God bless this reading. The New Testament reading is from Mark chapter 1, verses 16 to 20. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat, with the hired men, and followed him. And may God bless this reading from his word. Amen. Thank you, Mabel and John. One of the 
people who has influenced me a lot through her writings is a creative uh, writer from New Zealand uh, called Joy Cowley. And I'm going to uh, share with you one of her reflections uh, as it relates to our theme today of celebrating life's journey with Jesus. It's called Follow Me. At first, the call is gentle, no more than a whisper, a small ripple in the flow of a busy day. And it's only at the third or fourth time that I stop to listen and laugh. Who? Me? This is silly. I must be imagining things. And anyway, I'm the independent kind, not made to follow a leader. The call gets louder and more insistent. Leave your boat. Forget your nets. You're hungering for more than fish. Follow me. Discover the breadth of my life in yours. And your soul will be filled with the goodness of God. The call is real enough, but I still don't follow. To tell the truth, I feel rather uncomfortable. Why should the Holy One seek me out? I know boats and nets and how to sell fish, and that's all there is to my experience. Shouldn't he call a better qualified person, someone who's been trained for discipleship? But he keeps on saying it. Follow me. And when I lift my eyes from my boats, my nets, and a preoccupation with my separate existence, I see a world made large by his love. For the call is made not to me alone, but to every living soul on the planet. We all have the light of his life in us. We are all made to feast on the goodness of God. Let's take a moment to be quiet as we pray. Life-giving God, in these moments we ask that you will speak to us. That if there is something that we need to hear today, we will hear it. If there is some way we need to obey today, that we will give our obedience. If there is some new direction that you are calling us to take, may we follow you and give to us thoughts beyond our own thoughts, thoughts that pass into prayer and prayer that passes into love and love that passes into life with you forever. We offer our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the great people of history, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was a, a German Lutheran pastor. He stood firmly against all the devilish ways of Hitler and the Nazi regime. And of course, he suffered for it. 
his strong faith in God and his living discipleship of Jesus were so strong in his life that he would never surrender that. Sent to concentration camps and prison and eventually hanged on Good Friday, 1945. He paid the ultimate price for being one who celebrated life's journey with Jesus. And one of the most amazing books that I've ever read are his letters and papers from prison. In Tegel Prison in April 1944, the year before he was hanged, he recorded in his diary this significant question that is just as vital for us in 2021 here in Nogbride as it was in 1944 in Tegel Prison in Germany. And the question that he wrote in his diary that day was this, who is Jesus Christ for us today? We're not just interested in history. We're not just interested in the Bible. We're not just interested in all the centuries of faith that have gone before but that lively question for today, who is Jesus for us today? And one word that I want to share with you today is that he is the one who calls us to a journey. This is not only a central understanding of the Judeo-Christian faith, through all these centuries of exodus and wandering and exile, but of Jesus who spoke of himself as the way. So it's not only a path to follow, but we're walking with the one who is himself the way. The word Christian only appears three times in the New Testament. Because in the early days, those people who followed Jesus were known as the people of the way, of the way of Jesus. So that from earliest times has been an essential part of understanding our Christian life and journey. We are people of the way of Jesus. There is a Celtic saying which encourages the journey. Let your feet follow your heart until you find your place of resurrection. Let your feet follow your heart. And our feet today not only follow our hearts, but follow him who is the way. And part of that great invitation to follow is to keep Jesus central to the life of the world. When we lived in Oxford, I would go occasionally to Botley Wood to gather logs for those cold days of winter when you love sitting beside a, a fire. Maybe... In the years ahead, we'll not be able to do that because of our commitment to climate change. But there'll be small things in a way to let go for the sake of the world and its future. But I used to go to collect logs from Botley Wood. And one day when I was there, a young man was helping me with the logs. And it turned out in our conversation that he was a student uh, at Cudston college not far from Oxford, a student for the Anglican ministry. And in the conversation, I said to him, and why, why are you wanting to do this? Why are you spending these days studying and praying and thinking to give your life to this ministry? 
And his answer was very clear and very quick, because I want to keep the story alive. I want to keep the story of Jesus alive in the world, not just in the church. That beyond the church, people will hear this story of a love that calls them and a life that is offered to them. Mark's gospel, as you know, is the first gospel to be written. And he wrote it on the basis of much of what Peter shared with him. But it's different from the other gospels in one sense, that it has that very quick pace Mark moves through the events very quickly and there's always an urgency about his message. One clue to that is noticing how many times in his gospel he uses the word immediately. It was an urgent response that was needed. And so what do we read? That when Jesus said to the fishermen, come Follow me. What does Mark record? And immediately they left their nets and followed him. So that response was urgent and ready. They showed their willingness to do it. So today as we think about what it means for us to celebrate the journey with Jesus... It's important to reflect on one or two things. One is this, that you don't fulfill the meaning of this journey simply by sitting around. Yes, times of withdrawal are important, of time and quiet and reflection and prayer and reading the scriptures and sharing the worship. But you'll only discover the full meaning of living the Christian life when you actually start to move. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't say to those fishermen, believe in me. They mightn't have understood all his teaching or all that he was sharing with them, because he essentially said to them, follow me, and then you'll learn. Because you'll see it in action. The words that I share with you become alive in the living of it. Another person who's influenced me in many of his writings is an American known as Richard Rohr. He's the leader of a retreat center in Albuquerque in New Mexico. And there's a sign over the entrance to the retreat center. Pilgrim, there are no roads. Roads are made by walking. And that's a profound, if simple, heading over the entrance. You will not know the meaning of the journey by looking at the map. You'll know the meaning of the journey when you actually follow. So remember then that Christian life is about movement. What you've learned in your times of prayer or reflection or worship have to become living and loving actions. I have often thought of uh, worship, and we've seen it in action at the Olympics, those wonderful divers and swimmers who've already got their gold. I often like to think of worship as us being on the diving board and then that worship is going to be lived out as we take the leap and spring into it. 
And so that's a reminder today that action must follow our praying, our loving. There was an Anglican uh, priest known as Alan uh, Ecclestone, and I remember a very wonderful thing, I think, that he said about prayer. The most important thing about prayer is what happens next. Wouldn't it be easy just to pray and then do nothing? But what we do when we pray is we're placing ourselves into the place where God can then help us to answer that prayer. It's not just enough to say, Lord, make me a friend to others. We've got to go and be that friend. There's little point in us praying, Lord, feed the hungry, unless we're going to offer them food. No point in praying for the refugee or asylum seeker without us offering them shelter and welcome and support and love. So the journey that we celebrate with Jesus is not just about following him with our lips or our intentions, but following him with our lives in the actions and activity of every day. You will learn as you follow him because you're walking in his steps. And then we need also to remember that he's often asking us to change our direction. Actually, the word repentance means to turn right around and go in a new direction. I'm going to leave all these other things behind. I'm going to walk in a new way. So that's the challenge of celebrating the journey. It will sometimes mean that we'll have to leave a path of our own choosing and follow Jesus. That's not always easy, but that, that's the, it's a radical demand that he's making of us, follow me. And he's asking us to do that whether we're in a place of fulfillment or frustration, in a place of doubt rather than faith, in a place of weakness, even if we'd love to be in a place of strength. He's saying to us, follow me. And sometimes this life-giving choice means moving from one place in our thinking or commitment to a deeper place. You know, you'll never discover the wonder of the fullness of the ocean if you only keep paddling at the edges. He's asking us to go deeper, to be more fully committed, to be ready at times to deny ourselves. And where does it really happen for us but deep inside our lives? In, in a little book written by a woman called Marva Dawn, it was called The Hilarity of Community. There's a little boy and he's trying to open the bud of a flower. And under his persistent effort to open this bud, the blossom falls apart. In his exasperation, he looks up at his mother and says, why does the bud fall apart when I try to open it? then when God opens it, the flower is beautiful. His mother was rather surprised and silenced at this deep question of this young boy. And then the little boy said, Oh, I know. When God opens the flower, God opens it from the inside. 
And that's actually where our new hopes and our new vision and our new commitment and our new following will be deepest whenever God opens our lives to new possibilities from deep within us, from the place where we think, from the heart from which we love, he will then open us. It's a demanding thing, actually, to be a Christian, particularly in a world like ours. Things that we maybe have to change in our attitudes or give up in our ways of thinking. You may remember David Shepherd, who was Bishop of Liverpool, but in his earlier years, who was a remarkable cricketer playing for England and internationally known and respected. He was also having a challenge in his life because the call to ministry was there at the same time as uh, his great love of cricket and his great ability to play the game. And someone once asked him if it felt like giving up when he had to give up his uh, playing of cricket. And he said, but it wasn't just so much like giving something up as something greater taking its place. So the freedom to move on and to make new discoveries is part of celebrating life's journey with Jesus. And then finally, I think we need to remember that we're taking our journey with Jesus. But we don't do that alone because there are many others on the journey. Being a Christian is never an isolated or private experience because one of the wonderful things about it is if we look ahead, we see others following and we look behind and there are others coming behind from all kinds of places and situations and personalities, and they're all following. As Heather reminded us earlier, and as the reading speaks to us, they're all invited, come, follow me. But what do we do sometimes? Will we exclude instead of include? You know, we often judge people at an exterior level and God sees deeper. You can take many examples. This scourge of racism, which we saw so sharply, particularly after the World Cup game, which England lost. Can you imagine what it must have been like for a young black footballer to miss the goal? But not only that, to be subjected to the vile comments of so many people. Can you think of those who are rejected because they've missed their way or fallen on hard times or made great mistakes and messed up their lives. And many pious people self-righteously exclude them. Think of today that great number of people who feel the church doesn't care about them because they're not our sort or they've no standing in society or they've nothing to commend them. Do you remember years ago people were wearing the little uh, bracelets WWJD? What would Jesus do? So think of the, the homeless today who feel rejected. Think of those people 
in the LGBT community who feel that the church doesn't care about them. Think about the people whose skin color is different. And we could give a whole list. Think of the women who have been abused and excluded. There's a long list today of people who, if we reject them, are never rejected by God and who are lovingly welcomed by Jesus. So the journey that we celebrate is essentially about inclusive and welcoming and loving relationships. And God welcomes them all. I close with this story about Gandhi. Gandhi <clears throat> was an amazing man. He had a, he had a fascination with uh, Jesus. And even though he never became a Christian because he was a Hindu, Jesus meant so much to him. He was, uh, in his earlier days, a human rights lawyer in Durban in South Africa. In the days of that vile uh, apartheid when black people were put down and excluded and discriminated against. And one day in the city of Durban when he was walking uh, down the street with a, another friend whose, sim, whose skin color was the same as his. And of course then it was regarded that if you were uh, as a person who wasn't white, walking on the pavement, and white people were coming towards you, you had to step down into the gutter to let them pass. And it was further down the street that Gandhi turned to his friend, and he said, it has always amazed me how some people find honor out of the humiliation of others. And the gospel says there is no honor if others are excluded or humiliated or denied a welcome. The second century Christian Irenaeus said the glory of God is a human being fully alive. As we celebrate life's journey with Jesus, with open hands, we want to reach out to others and say, with me, will you follow Jesus on this path? You'll not only find a new direction, you'll find a new life, you'll find a new purpose, you'll find a new meaning, and you will find that you are greatly loved as you offer your love to him. So on this day, as we will shortly gather in communion. Open your heart. Open your life. Open your mind as you follow Jesus and with both hands open say to others, come with me as we walk the journey in the steps of Jesus. Let us pray. We're going to think about others in our prayers. God of the margins, we pray for those living on the edge, the poor, the lonely, the alienated, the rejected, the strangers in our midst those isolated by mental or physical illness, those today who are suffering bereavement, those who are facing family breakdown, those who have crossed frontiers or missed out on education, those who slip through the net of social caring, whose voices are unheard, who are not quite respectable, though worthy of respect. 
We pray for those living in dangerous places. We think today of the people of Afghanistan who will now feel left alone against all the ravages of the Taliban and those who would seek to overthrow and destroy and kill. We pray today for all through these COVID days, all who are suffering, all who are anxious about their loved ones, all those who are struggling with their health. We pray for all the services of hospitals, and doctors and nurses, and all who in our wonderful National Health Service are under so much pressure. Strengthen them and support them in all that they're doing. We pray for ourselves that we may learn from our sisters and brothers about resilience and hope against all the odds, about celebration and sharing, that we may never make assumptions or make the church exclusive, but that we will live in the fullness of the love of God shown in Jesus, who is inviting each and all, come, follow me, and I will make you, make you new people as well as fishers who will seek to bring others. We thank you today, Lord, that your love includes all. We pray for the people of this congregation, each one, those able to be with us and those who, for any reason, who are not able to be here. May they know your love and comfort and peace this day. And we pray for this circuit with all the new visions, with this great sense of mission for all that Nogbreeder are seeking to do here, the, the garden and the welcome and the conversations and the open invitation to share. And Balnify with all the plans and visions of a, a renewed place for mission, not only in the church, but beyond it, and for the sake of the people of the community, it will be an amazing witness to the love of God and the welcome of Jesus. And we commit ourselves today to him to walk in his steps. And we join together in the words that he has given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we sing the hymn which leads into our communion how deep the Father's love for us.
And our final hymn, Will You Come and Follow Me? Blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace in the power of the Spirit to live and work to God's praise and glory. Thanks be to God. <laughs>